Good evening, everybody. Facebook world, Zoom land. God bless you. And what a, a beautiful moment to share in the word of the Lord. If you are with us, thank you for being with us. If you with us live, I should say, thank you for being with us. If you are with us in our on-demand recorded, thank you for being with us and pray God's blessing on you as we go through this study tonight. I really do appreciate being able to open your minds, uh, really position your understanding, your thought process to be challenged and transformed by the truth, challenged by the truth, transformed by the truth. And you being in a position to really know more of what it is that God really desires for you, of you, all those good things. And so tonight, we're going to be talking about strange identity. This, we may even focus on this for another week or two. Um, this is coming from two areas. One, the two messages that I've done the last two Sundays talking about, are you really my son? And of course, from Genesis 27. I really have it impressed upon me to do a bit of a deep dive in some of the perspectives of this text because it communicates a strange identity that we have, but also a strange identity that the Lord Jesus has. Uh, I'll start with talking about some of the, you know, I guess you say metaphoric tones, illustrative aspects that are in this, but we'll do that after we pray for our time together and then we will jump back into it. All right. So, Father, we give you thanks for this wonderful privilege, this time of gathering, this time of sharing, and doing so in such a way that we may really benefit so much from the goodness that you have provided us, the goodness that is a reflection of who you are. And so tonight, we ask that you would bless us, bless our hearing, bless our receiving, bless our believing, bless our doing, bless our delivering to the praise of your glory and to the benefit that comes with it. We give you thanks in Christ Jesus. Amen. All right. So, illustrations, parallels. I want to start by saying the word of God tells us that God's thoughts are not our thoughts and his ways are not our ways. Since his thoughts are not our thoughts and his ways are not our ways, it's very important that we look at the word of God from his thoughts and his ways. When we look at it from our thoughts and our ways, we're always going to get it wrong. Okay, let me just tell you, when you think about what we're going to be talking about in Genesis 27, this strange identity perspective, let's go back to Sunday. And if you were with me in one of those two Sunday messages, the last two, you'll know that the thumbnail for that video was, you know, why did God co-sign the blessing of Jacob? In other words, why did God bless deception? Why did God bless trickery? Why did God get behind this idea of tricking Isaac to bless Jacob? Mm. <laughs> Let me just start by saying God did not get behind trickery, deception, or anything of the sort. 
God didn't get behind that at all. Why? Because his thoughts are not our thoughts and his ways are not our ways. We saw deception and we're going to read through it so you can see. We saw deception. God saw what he had always intended. We'll come back to that. I want to go ahead and get into our text today. It's Genesis 27, 1 through 29. And I want to read it so we can hear the story, hear what it is we should be thinking about it, get ourselves familiar with it so we can be of a mindset of seeing the big picture of the text that we're focused on. We'll start with verse 1 of chapter 27 of Genesis. When Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son, and he answered, Esau answered, Here I am. He said, Behold, I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now then, take your weapons, your quiver, and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me, and prepare for me delicious food such as I love, and bring it to me so that I may eat it, that, I, that my soul may bless you before I die. Now, Rebecca was listening when Isaac spoke to his son Esau. So when Esau went to the field to hunt for game and bring it, Rebecca said to her son Jacob, I heard your father speak to your brother Esau. Bring me game and prepare for me delicious food that I may eat it and bless you before the Lord before I die. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice as I command you. Go to the flock and bring me two good young goats so that I may prepare from them delicious food for your father, such as he loves. And you shall bring it to your father to eat so that he may bless you before he dies. But Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, behold, my brother Esau is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. Perhaps my father will feel me, and I shall seem to be mocking him and bring a curse upon myself and not a blessing. His father said to him, let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go, bring them to me. So he went and took them and brought them to his mother. And his mother prepared delicious food, such as his father loved. Then Rebekah took the best garments of Esau, her older son, which were with her in the house, and put them on Jacob, her younger son. Mm. And the skins of the young goats she put on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. And she put the delicious food and the bread, which she had prepared into the hand of her son, Jacob. So he went into his father and said, my father. And he said, Isaac, here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Now sit up and eat of my game that your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, how is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? He answered, because the Lord, your God, granted me success. Then Isaac said to Jacob, please come near that I may feel you, my son, to know whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, who felt him and said, the voice is Jacob's voice. 
but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. He said, are you really my son Esau? He answered, I am. Then he said, bring it near to me that I may eat of my son's game and bless you. So he brought it near to him and he ate and he brought him wine and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, come near and kiss me, my son. So he came near and kissed him. And Isaac smelled the smell of his garments and blessed him and said, see, the smell of my son is as the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. My God give you of the dew of heaven and of the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. Let peoples serve you and nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Curse be everyone who curses you and bless be everyone who blesses you. There's a lot there, which is why I said we'll probably spend a couple of weeks in this. Strange identity. Strange identity. Strange in the sense that one Jacob is not Esau, but he is accepted as if he is Esau. But then there's this idea here that we see that communicates something to us much bigger than just what is here. Our Lord Jesus says something in his word, more so in his words, he says, uh -oh. in John, the fifth chapter, says a very unique thing. He's talking to the religious leaders and he says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you might have life. I want you to take note of this portion here. He says to these religious leaders, they search the scripture for eternal life. But first and foremost, when he says it is they that bear witness about me, he's saying that the eternal life is not something you can attain in and of yourself just by knowing what the scripture says. You must know who the scripture is about. Because in the scriptures is eternal life. But it's in eternal life because it is in the one who gives life. It is the one who is the fullness of life. And that's Jesus. Now, the reason I bring this up is because this statement that Jesus made is a perfect connection for this passage, Genesis 27, that we are dealing with. Here's what I mean. We are seeing not the identity of Jacob. We are actually seeing the identity of God. I just want you to kind of ruminate on that for a moment. Meditate on it. We're not seeing the identity of Jacob or Esau. We're actually seeing the identity of God. Now, we are seeing the identity of Jacob in the sense that as we see the identity of God, we get to see the identity of Jacob in a way that points to us, that speaks to our identity. But we first and foremost must Look at the identity of Jesus. Let, let me explain something. 
I absolutely want to encourage you to understand that the word of God has many principles that apply to our everyday life, many principles that apply to strategies and opportunities and goodwill and morale and all those types of things. However, at its height and its depth, the word of God, especially the Old Testament, the reason I say especially Old Testament is because of what Jesus said. This was the writing of the New Testament. The writing of the New Testament was always pointing back to the Old Testament. And in many instances, majority of the time in that time, they were referencing and preaching the gospel, the message about God, his kingdom and his Christ from the Old Testament. So that was their scripture. Today we have the Old and the New Testament as the Bible, the bound Bible, and that's our scripture both but what jesus was saying was the old testament text is where the gospel was preached from mm, i got excited on that so ultimately when we read the old testament we who believe in christ are to be reading the old testament seeing the testimony of jesus not just the testimony of Jesus in that Jesus is saying something, but we are to see how those who were moved to write and to communicate are testifying about the nature of Jesus, the identity of Jesus, and how the identity of Jesus communicates our identity. Hmm. Here, we see some interesting facts at the very beginning of our text. First and foremost, it tells us, one, that Isaac was old. So it speaks of agedness, wisdom, uh, years, and experience. It also speaks of the fact that he was blind. His eyes were dim so that he could not see. That means he was blind. <laughs> As the church say, amen. He called Esau, right? And when he called Esau, there's some things here that we see. I want it to be understood that this situation was something that was established by God for the blessing to be passed down to the young, to the son, okay? Abraham did it with Isaac. Isaac was now about to do it with his son. The custom, of course, was for the older son to receive the blessing. I want to make note to you that there is this unique perspective we must introduce in order to ensure that there is an absolute awareness of what was in the mind of Rebecca while all of this was going on. Let's make note of this. It says that now Rebecca was listening when Isaac was speaking to Jacob. I don't think she was eavesdropping. Okay, let me just make sure I'm clear. I do not think she was eavesdropping. I believe she was going about her natural, organic functions. And what ended up happening was she began to hear what Isaac was saying, and it piqued her interest because of what the subject matter was. Let me tell you why it piqued her interest. Let's go over to the 25th chapter. I want you to see something. And the Lord, this is uh, 25th chapter, 21st verse. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. There was a point where Rebecca was not able to have children. And the Lord granted his prayer. And Rebecca, his wife, conceived. The children struggled together within her. That means they were twins. There's two in the womb. And she said, if it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. She prayed about it. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb and two peoples from within you shall be divided. 
The one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. My God today. Hmm. I want you to see something. I'm going to read on a little bit. I was going to say something. When her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body, like a hairy cloak. So they called his name Esau. Why? Because he was hairy. That's why. Afterwards, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob, heel grabber. Kind of trickery. You try to hold things back. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. Okay. And it said to us that the older would be strong. One would be stronger. So the older would be stronger. And then the younger would be over the older. Now, I want you to hear something. That's what the Lord said to her. But let me tell you what I absolutely know. L let's, let's talk about this for a moment before I get into more detail. I think one of the things that tends to happen in the scriptures is that we take the human element out of the spiritual dynamic. Because there's certain information that is not necessarily communicated. Bless you. Listen, listen well. I find myself in the position as a husband. I have two daughters, which means I have had experience with a wife who has been pregnant. I guarantee you that when my wife is dealing with things, she communicates to me what's going on. She comes to me and talks to me about it and says what she's experiencing, what she's feeling, so on and so forth. I see her doing things and like, ooh, you know, and I'm like, hey, you all right? What's going on? You know, that that's reality. There's no reason for us to think that that was not the case for Isaac. Just because it was ancient doesn't mean he didn't say, you okay, baby? <laughs> Come on now. Y'all like, y'all ain't in here. <laughs> Come on now. I've been here this, tonight. I've been here. Okay, I know I have. All right, so you can imagine that when she had this situation, see, my wife, she would go pray about things. She would, but she'd also go to her OBGN. And she gonna come back and tell me what the OBGN said. Now, you say OBGYN, a lot of people say OBGYN. See, she gonna tell me what the OBGYN said. Why would I think that Rebecca went and inquired of the Lord what was going on, and then she did not come back and tell Isaac. I believe with everything in me that she came back and told Isaac what the Lord told her. And the Lord told her that the younger would be ruler over the older. Come on now. Y'all got to understand that Jacob's identity was well fixed before he got here. He was to receive the blessing. He was to receive the blessing. So here's what we actually see. We see Isaac operating. I want y'all to see this. Isaac calls for his eldest son his firstborn son. He calls for the one who's strong. He calls for the one who's mighty, the one who's blessed in the field, the one who goes out in the fields that the Lord blesses and conquers what's in that field. This is his choice son. Mm. This is his son of favor. But I want you to notice what the Lord did. The Lord, our God, made it to where at this moment that this blessing would be provided, Isaac was blind. The question is, why was Isaac blind? Well, 
Some would say he was blind so that he wouldn't see that it was Jacob because if he saw that it was Jacob, he wouldn't bless Jacob. To a degree, that's true. But you got to remember, Jesus said that this text testifies of him. The scripture testifies of him. So really, we ought to be looking for the identity of Jesus. And to be honest, this is a very strange identity. The scripture tells us that God said about Esau and Jacob, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Hmm. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. There's two things we need to see here in regard to Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. First, we've got to see the identity of Jesus. And then we look at the lower nature and identity of Esau. In the same way, we must look at the identity of God with regard to the nature of the father. And then we must look at the identity, watch this, the identity of Isaac. Here in this text, we see the nature of God and the greatness of God on display in the very limitations of human nature. Now, let me explain about this. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Jacob was the one received the blessing. Esau did not receive the blessing. Technically, he was the one that therefore received the opposite, which was the curse, technically. The blessing could only be given to one. Mm -hmm. The blessing could only be given to one. Here's what happens. The blessing being given to Jacob is a picture of someone who didn't deserve the blessing receiving the blessing. The picture of Esau not receiving the blessing is that of someone who deserved the blessing and did not receive the blessing. Okay. I want you to have this in mind as we progress here. Have that in mind. Jacob is a representation of one who did not deserve the blessing, receiving the blessing. Esau is a representation of one who was designed to receive the blessing, not receiving the blessing. All right. So let's go on. Keep that in your mind. So Rebecca hears what's going on. And she's moved to action. As she is moved to action, she does everything consistent with what Isaac has said. The food. She deals with not only the food, she deals with the specifications of the identity of Esau. Watch this. When she tells Jacob to get going with regard to this plan, here's what you need to know. Mm. She says, bring me everything that she said and watch what Jacob says. Behold, my brother, Esau is a hairy man. And I am a smooth man. Perhaps my father will feel me and I shall seem to be mocking him and bring a curse upon myself and not a blessing. His mother said to him, let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go bring them to me. Huh. I tell you. This, oh, this is about to get good. <laughs> listen to what she says. He, he, okay, I want y'all to back up and listen to this. 
Obviously, Jacob is aware of what the Lord told Rebecca. Because when she tells him what it is that he needs to do, he does not question in the way that you think. Watch what he says. Perhaps my father will feel me and I shall seem to be mocking him and bring a curse upon myself and not a blessing. He knew the blessing was for him. He just didn't know really how he was going to get to it. And Rebecca says, listen, don't worry about that. Do what it is you've been told to do. Go get the kids. Go get the goats. Bring them back to me. Go, go get the meat. Right? Go get the sacrifice, if you will. Now, listen carefully. I told you we might not finish this tonight, and I, I really didn't plan on it. You've got to understand, again, remember, we got to keep this in mind that Jesus said the scriptures testify of him. So we need to be looking for Jesus here. All right. Jacob says, my brother has this identity, but my identity is different. If I come before my father in my identity, he will not accept me and he will curse me. Does not Jesus say in the New Testament that we are able to come boldly before the throne of grace? Yes, he does. Why? Because the father looks at not our identity. He looks at the son's identity. So, so ultimately, just to make sure we're clear, it needs to be very certain in your mind that Genesis 27 and any other passage in the New Testament or the Old Testament is not about us until we see it's about Jesus. It's not about us until we see that it is about Jesus. <laughs> Let me say it this way. We must see Jesus's identity that in many ways is going to be strange to us simply because God's ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. But let's again communicate as it pertains to our focus uh, our text focus that it was certain that God had already communicated that Jacob would be the one to receive the blessing. But let's look at something. I like to ask this question real quickly. Isaac tells Esau to go and get the food, get, get the game prepare it the way he likes it, which means that Isaac knew how to prepare it. But I like to ask this question. Quite likely who taught him how to make the game in such a way that it pleased the father? I think it was Rebecca. I think Rebecca might have taught him some things. Maybe not just taught him some things, even if Esau was the one that taught him some things. I think that there was a sense that he observed from both father and mother that which would be pleasing to Esau. Not to mention, let me just tell you this, even if Rebecca didn't necessarily teach him, there were many nights that they sat down together while mother was eating. And I'm sure Esau really enjoyed what he was eating to the degree that he probably perfected it to the degree of his own taste and watched his father's response to the tastefulness. It's very powerful that here it is, Rebecca was able to produce that which was replicable to, watch this, Esau, to the son. Let's move on. Remember this. 
It was important to know that Jacob was really not being deceitful in this moment, but he saw how it could be perceived deceitfully. That's why he said, perhaps my father will feel me if I go in in a way that I'm just like I am. So he went and, and took the, the goats, as his mother had told him, she prepared them delicious in the way that her fought at the, the way that Isaac loved them. She also took the best garments of Esau that were in the place with her. Very likely Esau didn't necessarily have all of his clothing there, but she had some of them there. Come on now. But she had the best. She took the best of those garments. Put them on Jacob. I want you to see this. Let's not smooth over this. Let's look at it. Jacob is preparing to go in before the father. Remember this, Jacob is the younger son. Jacob is not the choice son. Jacob is not the firstborn son. Jacob is the secondary son. In other words, I want you to know that Jacob is a representation of human nature and Esau in him being the firstborn is a representation of Christ's nature. Remember I said that God stated, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. In other words, Jacob is a representation of the one that, didn't, that did receive the blessing but did not deserve the blessing. And Esau is a representation of the one who deserved the blessing but did not receive the blessing. And in a very technical way, the one not receiving the blessing therefore receive the opposite of that, which is curse. The firstborn received the curse while the secondborn received the blessing. Hmm. This is a strange identity thing. Why is it that the one who doesn't deserve the blessing is getting the blessing and the one who deserves the blessing is not getting the blessing? It's because in a strange way, God is communicating before Jesus ever comes on the scene, the reality of redemption and more so propitiation. And I'm going to talk about propitiation for a moment in a very brief sense. Propitiation is what we deal with as the context of substitutionary atonement. I, I, I like saying it this way to simplify it because when I was in college, uh, one of my professors gave me the very unique way of looking at the word atonement, at one meant. So atonement deals with where there was not oneness, there now being oneness. Or at one conditioning or condition being made possible. So Jesus was the means by which at one meant with God was made possible. Separation is the opposite of at one meant or atonement. So propitiation is the reality that Jesus was the complete payment for our sins, though he was not deserving of whatever the payment required to be paid. So he stepped in to our place and took what we deserved and switched it to where instead of us getting what we deserve, he got what we deserve and we got what he deserved. Not only that, not only do we get what he deserves, we also get to benefit from taking on his garment, putting on his clothing so that when we come before the father, the father may see our face, he may hear remnants of our voice, but what he sees is the attire of his son that causes him to proceed with blessing. That's why we see here 
that the food that is prepared is the food that Isaac loved. Not just the food that they wanted to prepare for. It was the food that pleased him. We cannot bring to God anything that does not please God. We must bring that which pleases God. And how do we know that which pleases God? It's because Jesus is the one that has prepared that which pleases God. Hmm. I want, I, want, I want us to see it. I want us to see it. Listen, I told you we probably wouldn't get through it. Let's start here as we get ready to close. When he comes in, Jacob says, my father. Does not Jesus tell us to pray our father? <laughs> Watch this. Isaac says, here I am. Who are you, my son? You may say, well, Isaac is detecting that there might be some fishy business here. Because he hears something. He doesn't see it. He hears. But I want you to understand, Isaac was not just blind because he was old. Isaac was blind because Isaac's blindness was to be an illustration of the nature of God who does not look at our sins or our inadequacies, but he looks at us to see if we are qualified by the nature of Jesus being present. Who are you, my son? See, I hear remnants of your identity, but I want to know, are you going to come in your own identity that I do not receive, that I despise? Are you going to come in the identity of my pleasing son? Hallelujah. <laughs> what does Jacob say? I am Esau, your firstborn. Most of us would say that's a lie. Here's the thing. It is true that it is a lie in the context of man's ways and man's thoughts. But remember, I told you, we have to first look at the scripture from the context of God's ways and God's thoughts. And then we look at it from the context of our ways and our thoughts. When the scripture tells us that God's ways are so far from ours as the, the heavens are from the earth and the east is from the west, what that's telling us is there's such a distinction between his ways and thoughts and our ways and thoughts. And it's not that our ways cannot be met by his or our thoughts cannot be met by his. It means that they are so distinctive. And if we're going to experience God's ways, we have got to ensure that we know the distinction between his and ours. Oh, we can have God's ways at work in us. You know how I know? Jesus said, when you pray, pray in this manner. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Whoa, kingdom come. That will be done. Mm, will be done. Aren't those the ways and thoughts of God? In earth as it is in heaven. Whoa. Even though his ways and his thoughts are so far from ours as the heavens are from the earth, as the east is from the west, the truth of the matter is this. It doesn't mean that his ways and his thoughts cannot be at work in us. And as a matter of fact, when they are at work at us, we can absolutely declare that I, in, in, the, in, in the presence of the Father now, listen carefully, I am Jesus, your son. You're not saying you are Jesus. What you are speaking of, this is why it's a strange identity. What you are speaking of is that the identity of Jesus has penetrated you such that it now causes there to be a conformity of your identity so that as Paul said, the life that I now live is Christ. I am dead and hid with Christ so that the life that I now live, I live now to the son of God. This is the Old Testament picture of it or just one of them at least. This is a strange identity. See, it's not necessary that you communicate, I am your son, Jesus. 
It's more so that you have the attributes. How do I know? Watch what happens. Come near that I may feel you, my son, to know whether you are really my son Esau or not. If you look at it from human nature, the ways of man, the thoughts of man, you're not seeing that this is not about deception. This is about the father in heaven evaluating whether or not he sees the nature, the attributes, the identity of his son being the conforming factor of your identity. It's okay to see you as long as you is completely covered by Jesus. He might hear your voice coming from your brain but the question is does he see all of the aspects of jesus covering you i want y'all to notice something the mother rebecca she put i want y'all to hear this she put the skin okay let me just read it so y'all know i'm not playing and the skins of the young goats she put on his hands and the smooth part of his neck Did you hear that? The skins from the creature whose life was taken. In order for that creature to have been prepared as meat to eat. Come on now, y'all following me? Okay, I'm gonna get there. In order for that creature, watch this to be prepared as meat to eat, its blood had to be shed. Are y'all seeing Jesus here? The blood had to be shed. And then the skins of the, of the goats, the skins of the ones that were sacrificed, that is what was put on Jacob. This wasn't about deception, y'all. This was completely and absolutely about our propitiation, our redemption, Jesus being the substitute. The hair on his arms felt like Esau's. Why? Because that hair on Esau's arm felt like the hair of a goat. And the goat, or in other words, scapegoat, the one that was slapped on the behind and sent out of the city and then sacrificed this is a representation of Jesus such that when Isaac touched his hands it was to be a picture of the father in heaven qualifying that who we are is covered in his acceptable sacrifice of Christ The garments that were put on him were a representation of the garments of righteousness. A part of our identity is in our garments. As a matter of fact, uh, my grandfather used to talk about this, how when you get clothes from someone, uh, you actually see and feel the attributes of that person's figure in those clothing. And over a period of time, as you wear it, it begins to now conform to your figure. <laughs> Come on now. Yes, Lord. See, the clothes were designed to be a representation of his garments, his righteousness, his royalty. And the food was to be a representation of that which was pleasingly prepared by him as satisfying to the father. We're not going to finish this tonight, but I did want to start with this. It's a strange identity. First of all, it's a strange identity that this is actually talking about Jesus. The goats are a representation of Jesus. Uh, the goats, uh, uh, Esau is a representation of Jesus, not receiving the blessing when he deserved the blessing. You see, see, Jesus got the curse instead of the blessing. He deserved the blessing, but he got the curse. 
And instead of Jacob getting the curse or not being blessed, he got the blessing. Come on now. Strange identity. In God's economy, in God's system and structure, it is not based on whether we think it is fair or not. It is based on what he has stated as acceptable and expected. That's what we got to see. I'll close with this. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything should be added unto you. Let me tell you something. We have been conditioned to live our lives seeking first the things that should be added unto us. We have been conditioned to seek first to pay our bills, seek first to ensure that we got a place to stay, to seek first to ensure that we have uh, uh, clothes on our back and food on the table. But he said to seek first the will of God and the purpose for which we were brought here and to live fully and completely and exercise in that first and foremost and everything else will be added to us, meaning our food, our shelter, our clothing. But that's strange because we have been brought up under the Gentile, the unbeliever mindset that you got to make it happen a certain type of way. But guess what? You do have to work. But God has a way for you to work that will be so unique to what you probably thought you should work in order for you to experience what you need to experience. And how do you know that? You look into the strange identity of Jesus. All right. We're going to come back next week and deal more with the strange identity and deal with the latter part as far as the blessing and some of the other aspects. Talk a little bit more about Isaac from a human nature, but I tell you this, this strange identity, I'll say it again, we got to start with God's ways are not our ways, his thoughts are not our thoughts, and so we need to first look at it from his level, and then we bring it down to ours, not try to make our level impose upon his level and communicate that this is what it is, this was not about deception, all right, let me see if there's any feedback, any thoughts, from anyone out there in Zoom land or Facebook world. Let's see here. Let's see here. I'm checking. I'm checking. I'm checking. I'm checking. All right. One of the things I want to say, we want to continue to talk about identity into the month of March. One of the things I want to say about our identity is this. More than anything, I want, I believe it's important for us to know that our identity is dictated by God's identity. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, which means this. God's identity is the dictate of our identity because it is not an equal identity. We have the same image as him, but not the same likeness, which is to communicate to us that our identity needs he is to give life to ours. To be very direct, that's why I am in this text is so important. I want you to see something. Isaac says, here I am. That's God's name. I am is his name. So him saying, here I am, is actually the representation that God is there to communicate and to actually convene what is to be taking place. We see Jacob also say, I, uh, I am Esau, your firstborn. See, when I am is in it, he can, he can dictate something that seems weird. Jacob was telling the truth, y'all. 
Because in the context of Isaac's thought process, Isaac was blessing the one whom he believed deserved the blessing. And when Jacob said, I am Esau, your firstborn, it is more so a communication that this is approved of God, that the one who is speaking received the blessing that is to be given to the one who is believed to be receiving it. Which again, the one who didn't deserve the blessing received the blessing. The one who deserved the blessing didn't receive the blessing. Strange identity. All right. I want you to be blessed. That's why we even talking about this because I need to say this. It is important that each one of us understand that our identity is not dictated by the identity that we believed was our identity. It's also not dictated by the experiences that have affected what our present identity is. And I, I want everybody to know this. Whatever you have perceived your identity to be, based on your experiences, what has happened, what has been said, what has been felt, what has been thought and believed, whatever it is, you've got to understand that your identity yet and still is able to be established by God. You have something you want to say, sister? Yes, Pastor. Good evening. Come on. Good evening. Good evening to everybody that's on Zoom and Facebook. I'm just grateful for the word I am when God says I am. And then he says, take my yoke among you and learn of me. As we come into these sessions that you have weekly, we learn more and more of God. And as you were um expounding um the first shall be last and the last shall be first mm -hmm. we always were taught one thing from our ancestors the way we're uh when you get a whoop and your mom say you know stop that crying or i'm gonna give you something to cry out be quiet so we're just rehearsing things over and over again so we have to unlearn so that we can learn of him and then we can become him Totally. So I'm just grateful that we can die out daily of the flesh and take up on the new nature of God and to be everything that he was an example. So he was able to do something that we can't pay for, but we can show him daily by seeking him, whether we're in the grocery store, whether we're at work, about just saying, thank you, Lord. And God, I just I appreciate you, God. I love you. But this identity thing is really, really in depth. And we have to be found going over the scriptures as you give them to us so that we can see God for clarity in it. And I'm just so grateful out of obedience to be obedient to the spirit and be led of him and to continue in the faith. May God bless you and your family is my prayer. I bless you as well. You know, as we close, I want to note something that was just shared. It was just stated that we can learn how to be like Christ. And I want you to see something. Rebecca told Jacob to do some things. Rebecca knew how to make Jacob look like, smell like, feel like Esau. <laughs> and so she gave him commands. She gave him instruction in order to position him so that when he went before Isaac, he looked like Esau. 
I even like this part here. She says to him, only obey my voice and go bring them to me. In, in other words, everything that I have instructed you is proven, is certain to give you to be positioned well to receive the blessing. All you got to do is do it. Now, listen to me carefully before I go. How many of us? Watch this. We saw that Jacob had some question about it. He said, okay, mom. Like, this might be looked at as deception. <laughs> she says, if you obey the instruction of what is predictably productive and certain, which is true, you have no reason to doubt. Doesn't that sound like faith? That's faith. That's saying what it is that God has communicated to be absolutely acceptable, even though it don't make sense to you, commit absolutely to it, and you will find yourself being blessed. I want to tell you tonight before we pray. Seek for the strange identity. See, the strange identity is really the premier identity. The strange identity is the identity that we are estranged from. The strange identity is the one that was initially established for us that we really don't have the absolute awareness of, and Christ has redeemed us, has reconciled us, refreshed us, granted us to be able to repent and come into the fullness of that identity. Be blessed with that tonight. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the strange identity. Thank you for the identity you really intended for us. And now you've made it absolutely accessible. You've shown us that we can learn how to take unto ourselves this strange identity, which is our true and premier identity. Bless my brothers and sisters. Bless those who have believed on Jesus, the one who was the strangest of the strange as it pertains to human nature to usher us back into the glorious presence of the Father. Thank you that he, he went out. And when he went out, we were able to come in. Huh? <laughs> Thank you for that. Bless us truly, consistent with his nature, because that is pleasing to you. And we give you thanks for it in him. Amen. All right. This is what y'all need to do. Be blessed to be a blessing. And you got every reason to do that because he has blessed us even when we did not deserve it. God bless you tonight. You take care and be well.